Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. We are honored to have you with us this morning. If you can take a brief moment, grab the black pew pad on the inside of the aisle on the pews and fill that out so we can have a record of your attendance. We're so excited to be able to worship together for the glory of God today. And we're going to do that by starting with uh, song number 464, God of Grace and God of Glory. If you'll please stand. the lives of his saints, he delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Let us pray. 
Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, for this new day of life, for the blessings that you pour down upon us like the spring rain that brings life to our earth. We give you thanks for this place, for this day where we can come uh, and join one another in hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. I pray that you bless those who will serve us this morning and deliver your word. I pray these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Please take a moment and pass the peace of Christ with your neighbor. I'd like to invite forward Mike Cunningham for a special announcement. As you received your bulletin this morning, you noticed a ballot there. This ballot, the process began several weeks ago when you, the congregation, delivered names to the nominating committee, and from that, this ballot was established and approved by the, the official board. I just want to remind you to take a look at this. This is the leadership that you will be voting on for the upcoming year. If you choose these leaders, do so by just placing an X in the box, after you've done so, when the plate comes around for collection, place it in there, or there is a box there at the back. Thank, Thank you very you. much. A couple more announcements. We have uh, VBS starting up this week. Holly informed me that we have uh, about 130, as of right now, signed up. Uh, potentially even more. That usually happens on the day of, the first couple days. And so uh, please be in prayer over our Vacation Bible School. This is a great time. Some of these students will be hearing Christ for the first time. And so be in prayer over your church. Uh, if you want to volunteer as well, I know Holly would appreciate that. And also 2 p.m., we're going to meet back up here to help decorate for VBS. So if you are available, go grab a quick lunch 
and come on back. Lastly, in your bulletin, today we're praying for Somalia. Uh, the Christians there in Somalia, have they face persecution. Uh, there's not very many of them, and so we're going to join in prayer today to bless them for their safety. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, what a joy it is to, to gather as believers, as one body, for your name's sake and your glory. Father, we pray that today, through the music, through the meditations of our hearts, through everything that happens during this, this time frame, it'd be lifted up to you as pleasing and good. Father, we thank you for the ways in which you're working and operating within the, the life here at First Christian Church. We thank you for those that you have raised up through the nominations. We pray that you would uh, encourage them. You would put the authority that you, you've placed upon them and they would be able to live into that to help continue to steward all the many ministries of this church for your glory. Father, we also pray for this week, the perfect time to live out the commission to, to preach the gospel. We pray you would give our volunteers the ability to do that so well through their actions and words. We also pray for the, the students, the kids that you have set up to come into these four walls. We pray that they would truly encounter the living Christ. That they would truly have a moment to see you. That their ears would be opened, eyes would be able to see, minds could comprehend at least apprehend, Father, what you are doing in their lives. May they feel your love and embrace. And Father, we also join in prayer today for our brothers and sisters in Smolia. Bless them as they face persecution from the government, face persecution from, from others, their peers. Father, we pray for their safety. Pray that you would bless them with courage. Pray you would bless them also with peace and such a desire to continue to evangelize and telling their country, their neighbors, about your love and about what you have in store for your kingdom in this world. Thank you, Father, for all the ways in which you bless our lives. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
love what the table represents. It provides a physical, a visual symbol, visual way of expressing that we are all unified in Christ. And not just First Christian Church, but the church across this globe. That we all gather around such a table and and take part of one of the greatest things that the Lord instituted. To remember his body and what he did. To remember his blood and that righteousness that lays upon us by faith. Let us gather here and remember what happened. Jesus was gathered with his followers the night he was to be betrayed. And he took a loaf of bread. He thanked the Lord for it. He blessed it. And then he broke it. And then he said to them, Take and eat. This is my body, which has been given for you. As often as you come and take of this bread, do so and remember me. Let us pray. Bread together, we come to honor you. We remember that Jesus gave his life for us. We ask for your blessings this week of Vacation Bible School as we share the Lord. Send your spirit to us with words and actions to teach the gospel message with love and forgiveness. In your son's name, amen. And in a similar fashion, we read that he took a cup. He blessed it and he said, this cup is a new covenant between us and our Father, and it is poured out in my blood. As often as you come and drink of this cup, do so and remember me. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, on a day when we call new leadership for this congregation, we come to your table recognizing that it is only by the gift of the Holy Spirit that we are authorized and empowered to serve in your name. We pray that you will renew our spirits through the sharing of this cup, remembering the blood your Son, Jesus the Christ, shed on the cross, that we could be released from our sin and achieve full fellowship with you. Let our obedience to you in the sharing of communion cleanse us and prepare us for your service. In the name of Christ our Savior, amen.
May we all partake from the cup in unity as we remember the words of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Set apart from our time of communion, we have a time now to give back. So as our ushers come forward, please feel free to give back in the ways of tithes and offerings. Father, we thank you for all the ways in which you bless us and all the ways in which you give to us, Lord, to steward for your good. And we pray the same for these, that these would be used for your commission and for your gospel to spread the, the news to the world with passion and excitement that you truly have love for this world, that you have love for your children. We thank you so much for all you do in our lives. And we pray this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, and the children are invited forward for the children's moment. Good morning. So, for the month of June, we're going to be learning all about the fruits of the Spirit. And so for this week, our fruit of the Spirit is love. 
So we're going to learn what love is, what love isn't. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 13 to see what real love from God looks like. So Charles, can you read us our scripture? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 20. And Parker is going to pray for us. God, thank you for bringing us all together and um, for the those that are sick. Um, bless them. Amen. Scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Thanks be to God. The word. Let's go ahead and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the reign and the rule of your Son, Jesus Christ, because it's, it's him that makes this day a unique day. It's Jesus that makes this gathering possible. It's Jesus that, that, that makes our lives purposeful, that makes them meaningful, and we thank you. Lord, be with us during this time. May this be sacred time. May this be a sacred space. We love you, and we trust that you love us even more. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to be with all of you today. My name is Derek Gerzano. Uh, for those of you who are our visitors or our guests, I'm not typically the one that's up here. Uh, the, the person that is usually up here, his name is Paul Carpenter, and, and Paul has gotten the incredible opportunity to go preach at a church he used to work at, and um, that is incredible. Um, but today is incredible. Today is incredible, not because Paul isn't here. That's, that's not the reason. The, the reason that, that today is incredible is because God reigns. Because God still reigns. Because God is alive. And because God still reigns, because God is still alive, we get to rejoice. We get to rejoice by going through the scriptures, by going through John chapter 17 and seeing the beauty of God, see the majesty of God working through the scriptures. So if you have your Bible with you, please go ahead and open it up to John chapter 17. If you don't have one, there should be one in, front of, uh, in the pew in front of you. Um, we're going to be bouncing around John chapter 17 through the entire chapter, uh, but we'll primarily be, through, be in verses 20 through 26. So, uh, John chapter 17 is divided into three parts. The first part is verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 through 5 is Jesus praying for himself to be glorified. Jesus is praying to be glorified. You hear this and you're like, okay, how much more glory could the Son of Man possibly need, right? 
But we keep reading and we see that, that Jesus is praying to be glorified so that the Father will be glorified. Whenever Jesus prays for glory, he's not asking for this glory to, to harbor it or to keep it for himself or, or to be selfish with it. Um, he, he's not like us where, where when something good happens to us, we want to keep all the glory for us. We want all the fame for ourselves. We, we try to bend stories to make ourselves look as good as possible. But what Jesus is doing is he's taking the glory that he gets and he's directing it into the relationship that he has with the Trinity, with the holy, beautiful Trinity. Because that's who Jesus is. He's a part of the Trinity. He's in a perfect, divine, unified relationship with God the Father and God the Spirit. So he's asking that he be glorified so that more people will look to God and worship. So that the world will look to God and fall in love with the Creator. And also, it's important to note here that whenever Jesus is, is praying about being glorified, he's asking to be led to his death. Because when, we know whenever Jesus is led to his death, he's put on a cross, he, he embraces the sins of the world, um, he embraces the, the sins of his people, and he lowers himself. He lowers himself below any man. He, he, he goes and washes the feet of the lowest of the low, and by doing so, he earns himself a seat above anybody else. He receives the glory by lowering himself, by, by, by um, obeying himself, to, being obeying to, to death itself. And by doing that, he gains the highest seat and he receives glory so that that, can, that glory can be unified with God the Father. The second part is verses 6 through 19. And this is a, a continuation of the prayer. Jesus is praying, but this time he's directing it to his disciples. Jesus is praying for his disciples. Now what he asks is, and, and some of your translations may say this, he's asking for his disciples to be protected. In the Greek, it, it, it actually says to be kept under the name of the Father. Jesus is asking that the disciples be kept under the name of God the Father. Now why is he asking for this kind of protection? Why is he asking for, for the disciples to be kept under the name of the Father? Is it so that they'll, they'll avoid all, all sadness, all heartache, all harm? Is it so that, that they'll avoid disease or, or hurt in any way? No, none of those reasons. Now don't get me wrong, God definitely cares about their suffering and their state of being, but what God cares about more is about their disunity. Jesus is praying for the disciples so that they will not be disunified. He wants them to be together. He wants them to be of one mind. He wants them to be in complete unity. And this is really difficult, though. This, how, how will this possibly happen? Because we, we uh, read through the scriptures, we, we can do some study, studying, and we see that the disciples are actually a kind of diverse group, different ages, different friendships, different... Um, what am I thinking of? Different home backgrounds, different professions even. Um, we have zealots, we have tax collectors, we have fishermen, but Jesus wants them to be one. So how can they possibly achieve this? How can they possibly do this? And well, you guessed it, it's the classic Bible answer, Jesus Christ. That's how they'll be one, through Jesus Christ. The only way that the disciples will actually be unified and be one is through Jesus himself. If they are in Jesus and Jesus is in them, if they are looking to Christ as their one goal, as their one fulfillment, as the one thing that they're driving towards, it's Jesus Christ. That's how they'll be one. Now we get to our, our third section of the prayer, which is verses 20 through 26, which was read to us this, this morning. And here, Jesus takes the first prayer, the, the prayer about glory, and the prayer about oneness, the second one, and combines it. And here, Jesus directs it to us. The original Greek, though, actually say, says that the, uh, the prayer is for the people who were in Jesus' time frame that actually believed at that time. So, at first, it's not applicable to us, but we trust that the scriptures are universally true and are universally for the, the church of God, for those who God is in covenant relationship with. So that means it's for you and me. So Jesus takes those two previous prayers and combines them for you and me and says, God, I ask that you make them be in complete unity. 
I ask that you make them be in complete unity. So Jesus is asking for you and I to be in complete unity. Now we read this and we're like, okay, is this a message of coexistence? Is this a message um, of, of going and being in harmony with the world? Is this a, a message of, of peace on earth? You hear that message often. Is this a message of me going out, with, go, going out to the world right now and going and trying to make peace with my brothers, uh, peace with my enemies, all this other stuff? No. Although that's a great message, although that's a message that will most likely advance humanity, that, that will progress hu- the human race, this is not what Jesus is asking of us. He's asking you and me, people of God, people who are in covenant relationship with him, people who are are, are legitimately in relationship with him, who belong to him, who are in his hand. He wants you and me, his people, the church, his beloved, to be one, to be one, to be in complete unity. He's not asking for that message of of harmony with, with the world. It's a great message but he's asking for the church to be one, to look to Christ, for Christ to be the one thing that that we marvel at and be the one thing that we follow as well, not anything else. But we, we, we say, okay, God, you want us to be one. You want us to be unified. You want us to be in complete unity with one another. Why? What will come of this? What, what's the point of us being one? What's the reason behind you desiring our unity? What's the reason be, be behind you wanting Sarah and Wade and myself to be one within you? What, what's that reason? And he lists them. He gives us two reasons. So the first one is, is at fall, as follows. It's in, it's in verse 23, so if you want to look there, it's uh, towards the end. The first reason for our oneness is so that the world will know that Jesus is sent from God. So that the world will know that Jesus is sent from God. Pretty much saying, so that the world will know that Jesus is the real deal. The second, so that the world will know that those whom are God's people are loved as God loves the Son. I'm going to repeat that one. So, the, so that the world will know that those whom are God's people, you and me, those who are, in, who are in covenant relationship with God, are just as loved as God loves Jesus. So let's go ahead and wrestle with some of these ideas. Let's go ahead and, and figure out what these mean. How will God, or how will the world possibly know that Jesus is real through our unity? So maybe a story and connecting a story will, will help. So whenever I was in high school, and it, it wasn't just yesterday, um, it was a couple years ago. Whenever I was in high school in Amarillo, I was on the soccer team. Um, go Raiders, by the way. Uh, not these. Uh, Randall Amarillo. Uh, I was on the soccer team, and we were horrible. I'm going to be honest with you guys. We, we were terrible. We, we just weren't good whatsoever. We, we were bad. We, we sucked. I'm, I'm going to just say it plainly. Uh, but, but the thing is, we had athleticism. We had experience. We had skill. We had guys who had been playing club soccer for, for years. We had some of the best guys in the district. And besides that, we had guys who had been playing soccer recreationally. And on top of that, we had an incredible coach. He used to play in college. And not only that, he still played. He was the best one on our team. He would jump into scrimmages, and he would show us all up. He would whoop us and show us that he still had it. He wasn't one of those coaches that that just told you what to do. He would show you how it's done. And so that, that was the best thing. And not only that, he was an incredible man. He was an incredible man. He had incredible communication skills. He was likable. You always wanted to be talking to him if you were in the same room. He was funny. And most importantly, he was like a father figure to me. He was an incredible influence, and, and he spoke life into me. He, he, he believed and, and followed after Christ, and that was incredibly unique to me. I longed for his words. I longed for his teaching. I longed to, to hear what he had to say because he was wise. He was, um, he was just a good man. That's what he was. But other coaches and other teams didn't see him like that. They didn't. The reason why? Our team sucked. Our team was horrible. If you want to know how bad we were, uh, we once played a game where we ended up losing 20 to 1. That's 20 goals scored on us and one that I really have no idea how we scored the one. It might have been divine intervention because I never remember the, the ball rolling in. So thank you, Lord, for, for that one goal, uh, for not a complete hum- humiliation. Um, 
But this game was so bad that we ended up uh, trading three goalkeepers. I ended up playing three different positions where I found out I didn't belong in two of those other ones and belonged to the, the first one. Um, it was just such a bad game. And by the end of it, the other team and the other coach ended up thinking that our coach was horrible. Why was this? What's the problem here? Was it that he actually was a horrible coach? Because he drilled us, because he, he kept us uh, conditioned. We were some of the fastest people in, in our school. We had some of the best players in district. No, it was us, the players. It was us at the individual level. We knew that our coach was perfect. We knew that, that our coach had done what, what he needed to do to prep us. We knew that, that he was giving us the right messages, giving us the right training, giving us all of the, the right gifts and tools that we needed to be successful. But what did we lack? We lacked unity. We lacked being a team. We lacked actually taking what he had told us, taking the message of, of, of going and playing soccer and going and being a team. We lacked that. We lacked unity. And so what happened? We decided to follow our own idols. We decided to follow our own desires, our own goals. We decided to, to try to show off for the girls waiting in the stands. We decided to try out, out our new tricks that we had just learned a day before. We decided to, be, to try to be the ones that would score the goals. We decided to be the ones that would, would try to show off and take all the glory for ourselves. We didn't have this idea of sharing the glory as a team. We wanted to harbor it for ourselves. And in the same way, when we are unified, when we as a church are unified and are pursuing after the oneness in Christ, the world sees that. The world sees that. The world sees the missionaries that we send, that we send, we, they, they see the, the miraculous healings that happen, they see the, the prophesying, they see the proclamation of the world, of, of the word, of the gospel, they see the, the, the radical selflessness of Christianity whenever, they are, whenever we are unified in God. The world sees that. They see that, and whenever they see that, that, that radical selflessness, whenever they see us actually proclaiming the gospel, whenever they see that the message has taken hold of our hearts and in our brother and sister's hearts, whenever the world sees that, they say, huh, okay, their God just might be real. Their God might, might actually be real. And in doing so, they're actually glorifying our Father. They're actually glorifying our God. So through our oneness, through our unity, through our like-mindedness in Christ, the world glorifies our God. The world ends up glorifying our God if we are like-minded. But if not, if, if we're disunified, if we constantly ha have... Um, difference within us, if we're constantly um, in strife as, as the people of God, what sort of image does that communicate for our God? We know the truth. We know that our God is perfect. We know that our God is beautiful and radiant and full of splendor. But whenever we fail, we give that image off to the world. We make them think, huh, okay, maybe God's not real. And so that's reason number one. That's reason number one for, for actual unity and actual oneness in God. Reason number two, reason number two for our unity and oneness in God is that the world will know that those who are God's people, you and me, you and I, those in covenant relationship, are loved as Jesus Christ is loved by the Father. That's a tricky one, so I'm going to repeat it. You and I, by our unity, will show the world that we are God's beloved. We'll show the world that we actually are God's people. We'll show the world that, that, that God actually cares for us as he cares for his son, and that's incredibly mighty. That's a high compliment, if I've ever heard of one, to point at, at one of you and say, hey, God loves you. Robin, God loves you as much as he loves Jesus Christ. That makes me melt. That, that makes my heart incredibly warm to, to know that God loves me as much as he loves his perfect son, his perfect son who was at the beginning of creation, who, who is full of splendor, who is full of radiance. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is it that we as God's people are that loved? That's incredible. That's beautiful. Let that sink in. You are as loved as God loves his son. Now, some of you may, may be saying, okay, that's, 
that's kind of weird. That, that, that's, um, doesn't God just have a general love for everyone? Doesn't, doesn't God love all his creation? Yes, God definitely loves all his creation. But typically we'll hear that this message of fairness in the world. We'll hear, okay, if I'm not receiving the same portion as my brother, if I'm not receiving the same amount of love, the same amount of gifts, the same amount of, of, of abilities and opportunities as my brother's, then that entire idea should just be rejected completely, right? But Scripture actually tells us otherwise. Scripture tells us, hey, you as God's people, you're loved. You're loved immensely. You're loved way more than, than just a fish in the sea. How, how, how reassuring is that that we're loved more than just any general creation? We're loved like Jesus is loved. And if you are uneasy about this concept of having this specific love, and the world not having that specific love, let me um, go through this. Maybe this, this analogy will help. So I'm married to a beautiful woman. Her name is Kristen Gerizano, uh, previously Kristen Smith, but, you know, Gerizano is a little bit cooler. Um, sorry for any Smiths out there. And so this is a representation of that covenant that I've made with her. That's a representation of, of the promise that her and I have, have gotten into that I will pour my love into her and that she will pour her love into me and will desire oneness, will desire to be unified through thick or thin until literal death do us part, until that actual act of dying separates us. So if you were to go out to the street right now and point to someone, um, any random stranger, and be like, hey, do you love that person? I would tell you, yeah, in a general sense, I do love them. I want to follow after, follow after God's heart. I want to love my neighbor. I want to love God's creation. And we are all God's creation. And so in a general sense, yes, I do love that random stranger that's walking by. But if you were to ask me, do you love that random stranger as much as you love your wife? I'd say absolutely not. I'm not in covenant relationship with that person. I'm in covenant relationship with her. I've promised myself to her. And in the same way, we are in covenant relationship with God. So God looks at us and says, yes, I love you as much as I love my son, Jesus Christ. But if we just point at some random thing and create, says, I love that thing. I'm still sovereign over that thing. I'm still the ruler and the maker and the creator over all those things. And so I won't retract my hand. But no, I don't love that, that random object as much as I love my perfect son. See that comparison? So by our unity, by our togetherness, by our, our, our unity, our perfect unity and complete unity in Christ, the world recognizes us as his dearly beloved. The world recognizes us as his dearly beloved. So these two messages, um, or these two reasons for our oneness are incredibly important. We, we, we need to live into this oneness. We need to, to have this idea of being unified with Christ, of being unified with our brothers and sisters. It's crucial for God's people to be one. It's crucial for, for the mission of God. But the big question is, how do we go about being one with Christ? How do we go about being unified with, with God and with God's people as well, with our brothers and sisters and with God? How do we do this? Do we go and get the same haircut? Do we go and do, uh, go and start wearing the same clothes? Uh, do we go and kind of start eating the same foods, doing the same activities, talking the same? Because if so, then we'd be clones or start getting into uh, being a cult or robots, and that's just terrifying. So I'm sure nobody wants to do that. So that's not the way that we become one with God. Quick thing, our, our youth ministry has been studying the uh, books of Judges and of Exodus, and any of them could tell you that God does not want his people to be worshiping other gods. I think that that's something... Um, that's something fair of God to ask, that he doesn't want us to say, okay, I'm seeing you, God, but I'm also seeing the God of Baal. I'm seeing you, God, but I'm also seeing the Egyptian gods. No, that, that's, that's not being in a relationship with someone. That's not being um, in an actual covenant with someone. I don't go and pers pursue Kristen and then also say, hey, you know what? There's this other girl over here. Well, that's not a covenant relationship. So what, what our students have been seeing through the book of Judges is that God wants his people for himself. 
God wants the Israelites to send out the Canaanites, the Philistines, all other, other, other Gentile groups. He wants them to send them out because God wants the Israelites for himself. He doesn't want to share them. He doesn't want their Facebook status to say open or it's complicated. God wants the people of Israel to put on Facebook in a closed relationship with the God of Israel, with the God of creation. That's what God wants. He doesn't want an open relationship. He doesn't want um, the people of Israel to go and worship other gods. It's not how it works. And so in the same way, God asks that of you and me. He says, don't go and worship your your, your idols. Don't go and worship your sins. Don't go and worship your flesh. Don't go and worship Satan. Don't go and worship um, your, your desires and your goals and your dreams. But go and worship me. Follow my ideals. Follow Christ. Follow my son. That's what God asks of us. That's what God asks of us. The whole lesson about serving two masters, that thing is real. We can't serve God and serve our our self. We can't serve God and serve our selfish desires. We can't serve God and and serve um, our dreams and goals and, and our success and our glory. We serve God alone. That's what he calls us to. And so I can't just lounge around all day around my house. I can't just, um, house is a mess puts on Netflix, binges all the the, the Netflix that I possibly can, Uh, binges a TV show I shouldn't even be watching because I know for a fact it'll make me stumble. Um, And then I call my friend about it and boast about uh, my, my horrible decision at this point. I can't do that and say that I've been in unity with God. Because where's the meditation? Where's the prayer? Where's the proclamation of of the good news? Where is the interaction with my neighbor and loving my neighbor as God has commanded me to do? Where is, is, where's God in all of this? Nowhere. Nowhere. I have not pursued God. I have not sought after the Lord. I have not chosen to be unified with God. Instead, I've chosen my selfish desires. Now, in some scenarios, obviously resting and pursuing this this form of rest is appropriate. But in this scenario, I have not pursued after God. I have not chosen God. I have not wanted God. I have not looked at my God and fallen madly in love. I have not fallen head over heels for Jesus Christ and for the unity that he brings between me and my brother and between us and God. So my commission to all of us today is that we go and pursue God that we go and pursue after the Creator, that we go and choose to be in the fold of God. Let's choose to honor and worship the one that we are in relationship with. Let's not do that individually, though, because it's not just about Derek and God. It's not just about me being in right standing with God. It's not just about God and me. It's about God and we. Christianity has never been just about a single person and their relationship with God. It's been about the people of God with their relationship with the Creator. Hear that. It's been about the people of God, those who have been bought with the blood, those who are completely stained by the blood of Jesus Christ and the Creator of the cosmos. That's what Christianity is about. So let's go and actually be unified. Let's quit believing the lies the world and our flesh tells us and instead start living into our relationship with God, our creator, the one that we are in covenant relationship with. Let's quit preaching anything other than the gospel. Let's quit letting Satan lie to us about about things that that will will bring strife or, or separation between us because some of the reasons that Satan gives us are incredibly stupid. I'm not kidding. They're, they're so dumb. Things like, like whether or not our churches can have instruments. Things like whether or not our women can pray. Things like whether or not you, you, you must be baptized to have communion. Let's quit living into those lies and instead start preaching the gospel and let, let's start preaching the good news of the kingdom coming. Let's also start preaching the, the gospel of the, the kingdom being here and now. Let's start going and being unified with God. Let's start going and living into the, the, the great commission and the great commandment, loving our neighbor and going and telling every single nation about the glory of our God because he is so good. And in doing so, the world will know who our God is. In our oneness and in our unity, the world will know who our God is. 
the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we come to you right now and, and ask for this unity. We ask for, for, um, for this gift in John 17. We ask that you help us to, to be one. Help us to be unified by your spirit. Help us to be unified by your love. Help us to be unified by your son, Jesus Christ, and the blood and the body that was broken. Help us to be unified by all those reasons and, and not let the enemy, not let our, the flesh, not let the world come and, and lie to us about this reality. Lord, we love you, and we trust that you love us even more. You love us like you love your son, Jesus Christ, and that is incredible. Let's rejoice in this. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Um, as we go into our closing hymn, this is an invitation to anyone who is desiring to join the church through transfer of membership or who wants to profess faith in Jesus Christ. Join me.
one final reminder as we close. If you are free today at 2 p.m., please join us for our VBS decorating at 2 p.m. in Kirkendall Hall. Now, if you'll join me for our benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.